Today, the world of mainstream aviation is pretty humdrum. The right stuff doesn't have much of a role to play anymore. And the test pilot, once the cowboy of the air, has evolved into something of a scientist. Yet there are still designers and pilots who have the pioneering spirit. You can find them in small backyards. In their own modest way, they're just as dedicated as the Chuck Yeagers of this world to pushing out to new horizons. The Mojave Desert in California where Chuck Yeager first broke the sound barrier and the grave of many courageous men who gave their lives to stretch the limits of the possible. The enormous expanse of dry lake beds forms natural runways and the location's isolation satisfied the military's need for secrecy. NASA's Dryden facility at Edwards Air Force Base is home of the X program of experimental planes. The X-15 rocket plane of the late 50s was perhaps the most famous. The unconventional X-29, which had to be flown by computer, laid the basis for the sophisticated avionic systems of the future. Since the days when the X-15 was setting speed and altitude records, the programs have become far more specialized. The tests might seem less sensational, but they're just as important, exploring super maneuverability at high angles of attack for new generation fighter aircraft. Computers record every aspect of a test. After each flight, the aircraft is virtually taken apart and new experimental devices built in. Here you will also find the Lockheed Blackbird, the fastest operational plane ever built with a top speed of Mach 3. It's perhaps the last vestige of those wild days when pilots risked all exploring to the limits of the known and beyond. Cole Palin is at the other end of the technological spectrum. At Rhinebeck, New York, he's recreating the pioneering days of aviation by building an exact replica of a 1917 Sopwith Camel. The aircraft is so true to the original that it might even have built into it some of the early design flaws. And the process of trial and error he's followed in its construction is also totally authentic. He's been working on the plane over a period of 25 years, and today he's finally going to find out how it flies. In the tradition of the classic test pilot, Cole Palin's greatest joy is to power up and fly off into the unknown. Mojave is just another desert town, a major interstate transportation hub. The airport is a big moneymaker for the small community. Idle planes, old and new, are stored here, a sign of the crisis in the airline industry. But Mojave is most proud of its reputation as a major civilian test flight center. Wide open spaces and 360 days of good weather a year make it the ideal place. In Mojave, you don't have to go far to find the right stuff. Computers have taken much of the guesswork out of aircraft design, but each new plane and each change to an existing one must be given a thorough run-through. That's where test pilots play an indispensable role. About 10 years ago, Sean and Nadia Roberts, who were test pilots and engineers, opened the National Test Pilot School in Mojave, the only civilian institution of its kind in the world. in the back of the cockpit. You can have indications in micrometers on your consoles. 
You don't have any pedostatic probe on the nose of the aircraft. The students go through a program as rigorous as anything in the military, and joining the small circle of test pilots takes outstanding credentials. Looking for a good stick and rudder man who's got an engineering degree, an analytical mind, a disciplined pilot who can fly very precisely, can communicate and deal with engineers on an engineering level. Fly the aircraft, get the data, understand what he's doing, and be able to accurately report to the engineers what he found with the airplane, because if there is a deficiency with the airplane, he has to be able to report it to the engineers. But if he can't understand what's really happening with the aircraft, then he cannot report on his findings, and then the problem is never going to be solved. I don't know that frequency. I was going to ask you. Well, you want to Above all, the school teaches the students uh, to expect the, the unexpected. Expedition. Computer models and wind tunnel I testing may have ended the romantic the days of pure control. trial and error, but even so, Anything can happen in the air. The school uses a unique fleet of aircraft to challenge the student with the unexpected in a controlled way. This Piper Cherokee may look ordinary. Its steering system has been tampered with to give it horrible flying characteristics and the wings have been altered to distort the airflow. The students must describe the problems with total accuracy if they want to have a chance of making the grade. There's a great deal of testing to be done, but only by the best in the field. Test programs are much too costly, complicated, and require precise engineering pilots and not the old kick the tires, light the fires, and jump in the airplane and go exercise. The test pilot is the leading edge of the test team. He needs to be able to manage his test team. And his job is, the responsibility is awesome. And if he makes a mistake, then the aircraft can die, the crew can die, and most importantly, the whole program can come to an end by a mistake in the cockpit. So it's an awesome responsibility for a test pilot. Though few new aircraft come onto the market these days, even the smallest changes in existing designs need probing. The change may be as minor as a new antenna arrangement. Although the risk to the pilot may be small in these cases, they can never be eliminated. Nothing can ever be taken for granted. I don't think people will ever take out of their minds the way they see a test pilot and that it is a dangerous business. It can be very dangerous, but if you approach it carefully and you understand what happens to the aircraft, and theory is real nice, but once you get in the airplane, sometimes the airplane does something totally different. And if you're always looking for the known quantity as opposed to what's happening to the aircraft, that's where you can get in trouble. In some ways, recreational, amateur and part-time pilots and designers are the heart and soul of aviation. But they've always had to fight for their piece of the sky. Their leading supporter is the Experimental Aircraft Association, which holds a huge convention each year in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. If aviation doesn't have a place for the average citizen who can fly, we're going to be in big trouble. They're integral and critical to our overall aviation picture and air transportation. For the person who dreams of flying his own plane, progress has been mixed. Cessna and Piper have stopped mass producing general aviation aircraft, and few companies appear to have any interest in tapping the market for small, inexpensive planes. Potential profits are small. And in the past, liability claims have been a problem. The need for a spam can, a straightforward, easy-to-fly aircraft, is enormous. The demand is there. What is needed is a revival of the pioneering spirit of the 1920s and 30s, to bring the average private pilot back into the mainstream.
people are designing and building their own planes. And now, finally, small new companies are taking up the challenge. The new names in aviation will not be those famous names of our forefathers of the past. The names will be coming forth from new ideas and designers. The people that developed those companies originally had vision. They were one of the little guys. The little guys are back in force, coming up with remarkable new designs and finding new ways to build them. I think you're going to see a multitude of builders internationally building a great variety of aircraft. And in the long run, that's going to be best for the consumer because there's going to be more choice, more innovation, and to a certain extent, the competitive pressures will hopefully keep the price as reasonable as is practical. Tom Poberezny's hopes seem to be coming true. New planes are being developed at a breathtaking pace. They range from the ultra-fast Lancers to the low and slow Kit Fox. There's even a supersonic private jet. And most of these new craft can be built at home by a person who's a reasonably handy mechanic. The designs are sometimes strikingly beautiful. Bert Rutan is best known for the Voyager, the plane which set a record for a non-stop round-the-world flight without refueling. His designs, characteristically, look to the future. To come up with something new and address a, a new requirement for something, you, you really do go back pretty much to, uh, to a, a sketchboard and try different things. I would say the, having the courage to try something unusual uh, and then combine with the engineering knowledge of will it work, that is what's really needed. The Aries and Long Easy are just two examples of Rutan's genius. His emphasis on the imagination makes him the exception in this very technical field. We spend an awful lot of money on how to analyze, but we don't spend much money on creating an environment for creativity. Uh, much of what people do that's called design is really uh, better called analysis. So uh, design, I think, is, is something different. It needs to, it, you need to flush your mind of, of last year's model, as it were, and you need to be able to visualize load paths and visualize the flow over an airplane and understand just what it needs to do. Rutan freely admits he doesn't do it all on his own. I've been very good at taking uh, new ideas that other people have come up with and quickly getting them into flight on a manned airplane. You know, I didn't invent winglets. We were just the first ones to fly them. I didn't invent the crescent sheared tip, which is on this airplane. So people say, gee, you know, Rutan invented that. That's not true. But we've been very good at, at integrating a lot of ideas and quickly flying them. The Ares is leading to new ideas for cheap, light fighter planes. And the Very Ease may be the first of a new generation of civilian light aircraft. Visionaries like Bert Rutan have their eye set firmly on the future. In the prairies of Manitoba, a dream is taking place. To build a cheap, simple fighter plane unlike anything the world has ever seen. Its inventor calls it the Defender. If he's right, it'll revolutionize military aviation. Somebody asked me what part would the Defender have played in the war in the Falklands. And all of a sudden, I got a cold chill in my spine. I thought, my god, you know, if the Argentinians had just bought, instead of buying one squadron of Skyhawks, I bought 5,000 Defenders. Imagine what would have happened in the morning when that 32-ship convoy was coming from England. And they would have got up in the morning and looked over the rail, and here's two miles of airplanes coming, 100 aircraft. And behind that, 100 more. And behind that, a hundred more, and a hundred more, and a hundred more, and a hundred more, and a hundred more. And we're only the first 800. There's another 4,200 behind that. How would you defend yourself against that? Just how long do you think the Battle of the Falcons would have lasted? 20 minutes? Bob Demet has been working on the project for years. He built a prototype that reputedly made a flight from his little airport in Carmen but he was unhappy with the general design and scrapped it. He's still convinced, though, that the idea can be made to work. 
I decided the only way to do it is with a small aeroplane that is very cheap to buy, that everybody can fly easily, and will have in large numbers. And the key, of course, is large numbers. And uh, that's why I started developing the Defender. Uh, actually, uh, the Canadian government now regard me as a threat because if people start to listen to me, they'll soon, in five minutes of thinking, realize that what's going on here is a crock of baloney and that we don't need to be spending $18 billion in the United States to be buying F-18s. We could be building airplanes here in Canada that would defend the country very nicely, thank you, without any help from anyone. To fund his research, Bob restores old aircraft, although his heart is not really in it. He spends all the time he can working on the Defender. Its hallmark is the positively weird shape of the wing. The Venturi rolled out flat. And all we've done here is we've taken the wing and rolled it back up again. Only, only halfway around, not all the way around. If you go all the way around, it cancels its own lift because it's lifting off the top as much as it's off the bottom. So you can only use half the Venturi. So it's half of a Venturi. This is a Custer channel wing that you're looking at here. A fellow by the name of Custer was doing this already before I ever learned to fly. The Custer wing is proven to work. It can fly at very low speeds or even hover in a mild wind. I got interested in that uh, Custer wing when I bought a book one day in a used bookstore. And I was glancing through it and I came across this thing and I looked at that and I said, my God, what's going on here? You know, I've been in aviation all my life and I've never heard of this thing. And here this guy back in the days before I was even learning to fly was, was doing this, this business with the, uh, the lift generated by the propellers. What beat them was that they didn't have the means. It wasn't practical in those days to do cross shafting on these engines. That's what really beat them. And if the, the airplane was extremely dangerous because if one engine quit, it was out of control right now. It would just roll. If the plane is ever to get off the ground, the engine problem must be solved. What Demet was looking for was something technically simple and of low cost. After years of trial and error, he thinks he's found the answer in something called the free piston engine. This is the uh, beginnings of the, the barrel for the free piston engine. And this is as far as I've got so far with the machining. And uh, the principle is that it's a two-stroke air pump. All it does is make air under pressure. Just think of a pile driver that's also a free piston. Take the pile away and make it drive air. And what I'm going to do with the compressed air is I will have a multitude of these cylinders. I may have whatever it takes to drive the machine, the equivalent of about 2,000 horsepower or more. I can have 12, 24, 48, any number of these things. And all they do then is they pump air into a common manifold, and that manifold goes out to both fans. These aren't propellers, these are fans, eight blade fans and you drive the fans from the tips, like an air turbine. Demet has, over the years, ignored his critics. A stubborn commitment to a vision has been the hallmark of all true pioneers. Confidence in nonsense is a requirement for the creative process. And all it means is that sometimes you have to try some things that are nonsensical and try a bunch of them, and then in order to set back and then down select to something that might be usable, and that's the only path to something new. I don't do all my design work on a eight to five day. In fact, I do almost none of it then. Uh, on the weekends or, or sometimes sitting on a beach and just sit around with sketch pads uh, rather than at a computer trying to design. Some call Rutan an artist, but he disagrees. I wouldn't call it an artistry because there's, there's nothing on the airplane that's, that's styled. If you look at this airplane, for example, the Aries, and you see the shape of the wingtips, that's not a style. That was something that evolved through millions of years uh, in sharks and uh, determined that they actually it's better for induced drag than a winglet or than a common airplane shape. And sure enough, when you go out and test these things, you find that, oh, there are some improvements here. I like to look around at nature, uh, but I don't consider myself a stylist. 
Still, in aircraft design, there seems to be a fundamental connection between the aesthetic and the practical. Now, the beauty of airplanes, and the thing that uh, intrigues me about airplanes, is that something that uh, is designed and optimized beautifully for minimum drag, high performance, and good lift, uh, these things turn out looking good, too. His tireless exploration of new paths in aviation has earned Bert Rutan a place among its greats. His success is based on having a clear vision and the will to make it reality, essential qualities of the pioneer. Bob Demet's work restoring World War II fighter planes has earned him quite a reputation and a fair cash flow. This keeps his creditors happy, but Bob would rather be putting all his time into getting the defender off the ground. Research is time, and time is money. And when you have to take time off to build a Hurricane or a P-40 or a Japanese Zero, that takes time. So in the past 10 years, I've done all this research that I've done on the Defender while I've been building these airplanes. So if I were to have taken and done that research all at one time, I probably could have done it in two years. This P-40 will sell for close on a million dollars. That's much more than Demet wants his Defender to cost. His goal may be unachievable, but Bob Demet has every intention of persevering that I'm very seriously thinking about changing the name of the airplane from the Defender to the KISS. And that's an acronym for Keep It Simple, Stupid. In Oshkosh, thousands gather to show off, exchange ideas, and marvel at the beauty of what people with real vision and drive can accomplish. There are thousands of different planes here, like the Glass Airs, plastic aircraft of great speed and durability. They've been hugely successful with home builders. If general aviation is to regain its health, it'll have to continue to find new paths. Engines still create substantial pollution. Many designers are now experimenting with cleaner, quieter motor car engines. The new pioneers also have to develop ways to make aircraft safer, cheaper, and more efficient. We thought it wouldn't be, uh, it seemed that uh, people like to carry uh, more and more people and more and more luggage in an airplane, and uh, uh, so we redesigned this uh, three-place uh, cozy. Uh, I think it's going to take to the year 2000 before we see the, the finalization of our dream. I think you're going to see changes and improvements a step at a time along that period of time, but I think we have to be practical about this. You aren't going to get new manufacturers into the picture to get them to tool up, gear up, and get their product out in a short period of time. It's going to be one at a time, but what they're going to show is there's a market and others will enter that market. In the meantime, you're going to see the home-built movement, custom aircraft, kit aircraft, the airplanes you see out here, the Lancers, and the Glass Airs, and the Kit Foxes, they're going to be fulfilling people's needs. It just means they have to spend some time building it, but it's already been proven that there's a need because they're selling airplanes literally every day here. For the foreseeable future, the plane you build yourself will be the only truly affordable one on the market. The main task for the EAA is to inspire the home builder and help him with technical and moral support. People come to my home with a book, that airplane. I would like to build it, but I don't know how. After three, four years of encouraging and they're working, come with a beautiful airplane that they built. They, they did not realize they had the ability, but they had the interest. And if you have the interest and you associate with those that can help or create a motivation, it's possible. With perseverance and a lot of help from your friends, it's actually not so hard to build an aircraft. The home building movement is flourishing thanks to the efforts of thousands of do-it-yourselfers worldwide.
You know, we're in a society where technology has made tremendous advances, and you've seen it in the home build movement, where we went from simple steel and tube fabric uh, airplanes to wood, sheet metal, and now to the composites. What you've seen is the aviation envelope has opened up. There's been a, an evolution going back to basics, and so we've seen a rebirth of the light plane. So really, we've always had the light plane, but there's been a reinterest in it, a rebirth, part of it economic. And so I think you'll always see that end of the spectrum, but the top end of the spectrum is going to continue to grow. We're going to go faster, we want to go higher, uh, we want to do it simpler. And many of the people that come here to Oshkosh in the USA leave here, they've had a thought. Then they see what their neighbor, their friends have done. They go to many of the 500 educational forums, sit and listen, and it desire starts growing, growing. Some 16,000 airplanes built by citizens in the United States are flying today, built in attics, garages, carports, basements, because that desire Aircraft like these Lancers are the future of general aviation. They're flying proof of Bert Rutan's maxim that great performance and great beauty go hand in hand. And thousands of enthusiasts are at their drawing boards searching for the next innovation. The best of these ideas will make it off the ground and inspire new efforts to create something better. So the days of pioneering are not over. The number of possible new beginnings are infinite. Wind tunnels and 90 years of experience have taken a lot of the gamble out of building a new plane. Still, Cole Palin had no way of knowing how his new Sopwith Camel would fly until he tried it. Flies uh, just fine. I guess like a stop with camel should. But I don't really know what they fly like unless this is one. Now that I'm down, it was really a pleasure and I didn't see anything <laughs> shaking too much. General aviation is gradually recovering from the setbacks it suffered in the 70s. Thanks to the dedicated work of the new pioneers. <laughs> <laughs> 